Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special podcast day after Mother's Day, and we are honored and uh, blessed to have esteemed colleague here, Ms. Ann Vanderstil, join us for a reprise from last month. We're going to be talking to her about the latest events geopolitically, financially, and whatever inf other information that she has to offer uh, for you today. Now, again, if you are new, please do like, subscribe, and share on our Rumble, Telegram, BitChute, and uh, on YouTube as well. Ann, thanks for joining the podcast. Always great to have you. Good to be back, John. Thank you so much for having me. It is. It is good to have you back. Yeah, likewise. Did you uh, did you have a good Mother's Day, I, I, I trust? I did, actually. You know, I was supposed to be traveling on Sunday. We were at an event in uh, Ohio, a Patriot Prepper Symposium Scott McKay put on and had mm -hmm. a bevy of incredible speakers, including Dr. Sherry Tenpenny, Brian Artis, mm -hmm. Mel Kay, Sasha Stone, of course, Scott himself, sure. um, uh, folks from Tactical Civics. Uh, it was just, it was a fantastic, fantastic lineup. And um, I was going to fly home yesterday, but because I'm on the road so much, I had an opportunity to get a flight out Saturday night. I flew home Saturday night and surprised my husband. And uh, to be very honest, totally forgot it was Mother's Day. <laughs> it wasn't until I got home and saw flowers. I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ho hopefully your kids didn't forget. No, 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 they didn't. But they were all doing what kids do. They said, oh, moms, they they coordinated with, with John, my husband, and, uh, found out mom wasn't going to be in town. So they're like, all right, well, I guess we'll do other things. So uh, we're going to do, apparently there's a recap this weekend that I'm not supposed to know about. So I'll got be it. available for that. Well, good. You've got it twice then. That's awesome. That's it, right. And as you can see, I'm uh, doing my podcast here on the road here in South Florida, not too far from you uh, at uh, my family's cabana. And so I was able to celebrate with <clears throat> mom and family yesterday, which was nice. Uh, That's awesome. As, as I was telling you offline, you know, uh, it's funny coming from uh, LA Friday evening, it was about 65 and then got here and it was like 94. So it was kind of a punch in the face. <laughs> oh yeah. It's hot here. That's a fact. It's very, very hot right now. Definitely. And speaking of hot, good segue there, Ann. Uh, pretty hot, obviously, as you said, a lot would be developing from our last time we talked in April, now mid-May. Things are certainly heating up geopolitically. Uh, so I wanted to talk to you about that and just kind of, you know, open the door to you or the floor to you to kind of talk about what you've uh, discovered since we last talked uh, that's going on geopolitically. And then I'll kind of take my cues of questions from there. Okay. Well, let me just start off with a couple of um, exciting uh, developments that Operation Burning Edge had direct, uh, are really a consequence directly from the Operation Burning Edge, Michael Yan, myself, and the collaboration of other media professionals uh, have accomplished because this does have a ripple effect geopolitically. As you know, uh, invasion of sovereign nation has been the most successful tool to take down a country and destroy a population without ever really firing a shot. If they've successfully destroyed many countries in Europe. Uh, it has now been uh, breaking news that Ireland is full of um, middle, uh, should we say, young um, Middle Eastern men of fighting age. And this is in fact, the invasion army that is there by the United Nations that will, once the WHO pandemic treaty is ratified, will be the invasionary army that will uh, be uh, basically taking up arms against the people of that sovereign nation. This is exactly what we have posited happening here in the United States as evidenced by many citizen journalists and you know major publications like Epoch Times who joined us down in Panama uh, they had Josh Phillips just release a documentary, Weapons of Mass Migration. It's fantastic. If you haven't seen it, I highly encourage people to see it. Brighteon just released 17 Miles and a five-part docu-series following 17 Miles to educate people who don't understand the peril of, wa of mass weaponized human migration. So, uh, you know, with the partnerships we've you know included, Dr. Chris Martinson, who has Peak Prosperity, a very big podcast, Brett Weinstein, who's also uh, you know, equally a behemoth. Tucker Carlson has been looped in on a lot of this. He's done interviews with folks that have joined us down in Panama, including Michael Yan, my, my collaborator in chief on Operation Burning Edge. Laura Loomer, another you know, incredible platform to be down there firthand witnessing the, the, the uh, fighting age young males that are coming through the Darien Gap and are headed to the United States. And again, of course, Ben Berkwam and Oscar Blue, who have done exemplary work for Real America's Voice, also collaborators with Burning Edge, uh, you know, on the Panama side through Central America, Mexico, and of course, on the Texas side, where we have multiple citizen journalists. We've documented all of this. So we have, you know, by all accounts, you know, 
somewhere between 30, 40, maybe as high as 50 million illegals in the country. CPB put out a statistic that since 2021, 46 million illegals have entered, and those are the ones they know about. So all these stats of 10, 12 million, no, it's way north of that. You can safely say one in seven Americans or one in seven people, I should say, in this country is an illegal invader, and they're on the payroll of the government. There is more information that will be coming forward from an agency. I can't get into the details yet. I'll be on a call later, but we have a major whistleblower coming forward from one of the major agencies here in the United States that's going to talk about how this agency is turning a blind eye and facilitating weaponized human migration. Again, another invasion a vector into our country being, you know, facilitated by an agency of the United States government. So all of this is by design, John, to dismantle and destroy the sovereignty of this country. Because again, the people behind all of this, the people at the Committee of 300, the people at the World Economic Forum, the United Nations, they literally are after the world and global governance and America is in the way. So to that end, they are going to destroy America from within. Uh, we know about, you know, weapons and terrorists that have come into this country. So this is a this is a big you know piece of this puzzle that's destabilizing uh, global security. And as you know, Joe Biden has given up our national energy independence and has left you know billions and billions of dollars of weapons in Afghanistan that are now being deployed by state sponsors of terror like Hezbollah uh, and others, thanks to Iran and Afghanistan acquiring all of these. So if you move over to the Middle East, clearly what's happening in Israel was by design. I mean, the Israeli IDF knew about it. That has become very evident. So you ask yourself, well, why would they want their country invaded? Well, Israeli's biggest ally is the United States. And the central bankers finance both sides of every war ever happened. So there's a lot of money for them to be made using their friends over in the military industrial complex. Uh, Ukraine has expended an exorbitant amount of weapons and ordinances. We really don't have many more to give them. We have exhausted financial resources. We have bankrupted the United States. And uh, by that in of itself, the BRICS nations look a lot stronger than we do right now than Western civilization because they are now utilizing a gold back basket of currencies. They're buying and trading oil in the Chinese digital yuan, which is backed by gold. Same with the Russian ruble backed by gold. So we have we're backed by nothing. The full faith and credit of a country that is literally in the in the last uh, you know phases of collapse. So uh, you know it, it is a matter of time before we hit hyperinflation. Jamie Dimon over at JP Morgan is been you know basically shouting from the rooftops for quite some time that there's trouble on the horizon and a storm is brewing and you know by his own admission along with Citibank and Bank of America CEOs last October they don't have the money to increase their reserves from 0 to 3% and we never used to go below 50% reserves for fractional reserve currency banking so we we are really in a very bad situation and we don't have a, a um a treasury to back us up. We are wholly ex overextended, but you know when it turn when it comes to hope on the horizon, uh, no, we can't fight a multi-front war. We're going to have one right here in this country. I talk to patriots every day, and they're mobilizing quietly behind the scenes to make sure they are prepared with food, communications, and and of course national security, their Second Amendment right to defend themselves. You know this is uh, the patriot movement is never about offense when it comes to violence; it's about defense. But it is about offense when it comes to preparing. And so states like Missouri this week are meeting uh, because the state house and the state Senate both have passed SB 735, which is uh, their, you know, their right to stand up their own gold back digital currency. And this was a uh, sound money solution was proposed. And I think it was 25 or 27 states that all seemed on board with it. Apparently, you know, at one point, Florida looked like they'd be the first to market. But for whatever reason, the central bankers probably threatened people and they fell off in committee. Missouri is still around. The only troubling part is the governor does not want to sign this. He will veto it. So right now, this week is a scramble to whip the votes in both the House, uh, the, the Republicans and Democrats, to make sure they have a two-third majority when they when they send this to the governor. So it's veto proof. I believe if that happens, it will create a cascade effect. And this is part of standing back up our republic and our financial security. And, and hopefully with everything that Mike Lindell is doing and some of these other organizations out there, John, like United Sovereign Americans that are going after the civil rights aspect of our election integrity and bringing these cases to the Supreme Court in a multi-jurisdictional fashion with at least seven, 11 or 12 states, we will actually secure election integrity once and for all and roll back the illegitimate elections that have happened because civil rights were violated when state statutes and election codes were not followed in individual states, thereby, you know, basically... <clears throat> stepping all over your vote. 
and uh, you were disenfranchised as a voter on both sides of the aisle. So I, I look to the whole world as we're all in chaos, and right now they're looking for uh, they're looking for sanity at the in the United States of America. They're looking for the Americans to stand up and fight back because the other countries around the world, like Argentina and El Salvador, for instance, are standing up. Brazil is rioting in the streets. You're seeing riots happen in Europe over the farming crisis and the government trying to steal land, and that's what they're trying to do here. We're selling it to the Chinese and to Bill Gates so they can starve us out. Americans are starting to smell the problems in their own backyard. Mm -hmm. And I believe the banking collapse will facilitate a mass uprising here where we will finally toss tyranny where it belongs in the trash and uh, take back our, our government with you know organizations like Our Country, Our Choice that are helping facilitate the mobilization of people at the ground level in the counties to get rid of and root out the rot in their own municipalities and counties, which is a big factor to that contributes to the you know, uprising into the federal government that allows this continued um, theft of our sovereignty to continue. But the the global instability around the world is a direct result of weak leadership here in the United States, and that rot must be removed. And I see us marching in that direction clearly, but it's going to be a very bumpy ride because the rot is in the death rattle phases of their demise. And so they will throw everything at us to try and stop what's coming on November 5th. Wow, that's quite a uh, that's quite a thesis of summation of. of detail, I <laughs> Sorry, appreciate. I know it's no, a long it's, run on sentence. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's there. You unpacked a lot in, uh, in in a lot of copious details in a very, uh, you know, I wouldn't say succinct, but you know, succinct in relation to all the information that you shared. You got to you got to just kind of paint the whole picture. People yeah. have to understand this is a global problem, and right. the, you know the the decimation and the the degradation of our sovereignty here is directly related to all the global problems we see around the world. Because again, the United right. States needs to lead, um, but we don't need to interfere, right? We need to be that pillar of strength and we need to provide uh, our partners, our, our human partners around the world with a template of true sovereignty, with a true, with a constitution that is being upheld. And if we can provide that documentation and give people, uh, remember, God, the, the Bible is the, is the original law book, John, right? So there, right. you know, God gave us dominion over the earth. That's land, air, and water. That's your LAW. And mm -hmm. if we can provide a common thesis, right, for everybody to, um, you know, to admit, to uh, instill freedom for everybody, we don't necessarily need to be that big stick around the world because everybody eventually will find their their sovereignty, but it's going to take the people to rise up and toss the tyranny. And I think we're starting to see the collaboration happen. And I and I I see it because I speak to people around the world all the time, and it's quite it's quite remarkable, quite beautiful, but it's going to be quite turbulent for the while. Next next six to eight months, I believe. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree. I think you're seeing, and uh, we talked about this before in our previous show. You're seeing the wheat from the tear separate now, right? Correct. Or the oil and water, or dark to light, whatever uh, cliches you want to use. But uh, but but I do see, that, you know, the more that Americans and you know podcasts like this hopefully um, embolden and enlighten people to the facts of what's going on 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 a deeper dive, like you're doing, thirty to fifty thousand foot views, basically. Uh, then they can empower themselves to uh, be prepared accordingly, and it tamps down that fear porn that that the deep state has basically inculcated us for generation after generation. And then we can take those steps accordingly and work together. Because you know, like as everybody says, you know, we're all pieces of the puzzle, right? We're you and I are a little bit more front and center, but ultimately we're all in this community. We all have a part to play, and and we do that by working together, unifying, galvanizing, getting the facts getting prepared and keeping our faith, not fear, to your point. Uh, right. So th thanks again for that. Um, you said a lot of things inside there that were valuable, but two things that I wanted to kind of circle back on that you mentioned, because uh, we haven't really heard much about, at least at least on my end, I haven't heard much about it, in which, which is in respect to Mike Lindell, you mentioned him. Um, he was talking a few weeks ago or several weeks ago about he had more evidence that was pretty damning and indicting of the deep state. I was wondering if you might have any additional details that you can share with our audience about where he stands uh, in that process. Yeah, so, um, and I'm actually pulling up his website right now because I was listening to Sharona Bishop this morning. One of the emails I received from her was on a Zoom invitation. And of course, it went to my spam folder and I just happened to be looking at spam this morning. And so I actually listened to the Zoom meeting. I unfortunately was not able to participate in because I didn't know about it, but um uh, it, it talks about what uh, if you go to the Lindell plan or Lindell offense fund dot org, uh, Mike Lindell has been working diligently on proving that these Dominion machines were switching votes, 
this is what he has uncovered. This is what he has been reporting. I've had Mike Lindell on my show and I've given him the platform to reveal what he's found. But evidence was provided by Kurt Olson as the attorney of record for Mike Lindell on the fact that there's been decryption keys found in the voting machines. And he likens it to this. I'm going to read this quote from his website because I think it's very it really makes it crystal clear what we're talking about or what Mike's talking about. He sure. says, it is like a bank telling the public they have the most secure vault in the world and then taping the combination on the wall next to the vault door. Even worse, key logging features that would record system activity showing such control can also be manipulated or disabled, thereby rendering any penetration of this system nearly undetectable. And this is in his filing. Um, that he brought forward to the Supreme Court where he said, look, we have evidence of decryption keys. We have evidence that this is all being handled offsite through Serbia, that you know people can get in, anybody can break into these machines anywhere in the world, anywhere in the country and change votes. And what's worse is they can erase their footsteps if they were ever there. So it becomes very difficult. But you know, do you remember, John, when we be, when, you know the next morning after the election of 2020, um, we all, I stayed up till I think it was midnight or so. And then I went to bed. I was like, ah, Trump ran away with it. This is unbelievable. Awesome. You know, it's like to be expected, right? Again, mm -hmm. hundred thousand people show up at Wildwood, New Jersey yeah. and Biden can't even get, you know, the attention of a world leader. So, and without falling asleep in the middle of a conversation, there's just, it's just so ludicrous that they would even think that we would believe Joe Biden won the election. Right. That being said, he's sitting in the white house right now. He's clearly not the decision maker. Somebody else is. He's just a meat puppet, but he's still nonetheless the resident at 1600. So, you know, Mike Lindell has always been positing this theory that these Dominion machines were hacked. And, you know, he has been on this with the Dennis Montgomery PCAP data and all this. And, you know, of course, he was attacked when he had that symposium two summers ago where he was going to reveal the PCAP data. Um, then he had some people show up that tried to, you know, infiltrate and present bad PCAP data and all of this stuff. Again, these are all things that were reported coming out of his symposium. Um, I wasn't there, but I talked to a lot of people who were, and that is the resounding story, you know, and Mike Lindell has always stuck by this. If you look at that story and you compare it to say United Sovereign Americans, an organization, nonprofit of 10,000 volunteers who not only have tons of evidence of election fraud, but more significantly are actually attacking the election fraud from a different vector, in other words, using civil rights violations, uh, you can see how Mike Lindell's evidence of decryption keys and uh, the ability to hack these computers being front and center, in addition to the fact that the maladministration of these elections, in other words, right in the precinct level, at the county level, all over the country, 3,143 counties, you had state statutes to guide how you run your elections just ignored not used, not deployed. So technically you don't know who won because you didn't follow the statutes to the letter. These are the instructions like baking a cake. First you crack the egg, then you put the, the flour, then you get the whisk and stir it up. If you didn't do any one of those things, maybe in order, or you just omitted them, skip them, or just bastardize them, that cake isn't going to rise and it's not going to taste good. It's going to, it's not going to bake out to be a cake. So what do we have? We have an election that has Maricopa County, for instance, tons of uncounted votes that were in drawer three from the 2022 election. So there's just, and these again were statutes that were ignored. So between arguing over who won, arguing about whether there's dec decryption keys and arguing about the state statutes, i.e. your civil rights for voter, vote, which related to voter disenfranchise, you have a recipe to give the full picture to the Supreme Court and go, Mike expose this, so-and-so exposed that and United Sovereigns over here, Harry, Ma uh, Harry and uh, Marley Hornick ex have exposed the civil rights violations. You bring all this to the Supreme Court and they still balk at it and won't hear a case. And it's a civil rights case, which is why you have the Supreme Court in the first place. Remember 1964 mm -hmm. Civil Rights Act and sure. 1996 Help America Vote Act. If they won't stand up for your civil rights, then we clearly do not even have a Supreme Court, let alone a country. Now Americans have the big picture. Got it. Our government isn't going to uphold the Constitution. So we don't really have a country as they are, you know, as they're managing it. So we, the people, have now got to make some tough choices about how we want to manage and govern ourselves. Because in the Declaration, it talks clearly about the right to alter or abolish. When your government isn't doing as you demand, you have the right to alter or abolish it. In fact, 
you can find language like that in all 50 state constitutions. I encourage everybody, Google Ballotpedia and the name of your state constitution, Ballotpedia Florida Constitution, Arkansas Constitution, and read it and weep. It's all in there. And the people need to know they're that they're allowed to do this. So, you know, to Mike Lindell, I applaud the effort because he has just done a fantastic job. And I want to continue to support what he's doing, but I want to support what everybody's doing because this all goes into baking the cake, right? It's not just a one problem. We have many problems with our elections. And so we need to push for paper ballots like Mike Lindell is suggesting. Go right to paper ballots and hand counts, smaller precincts, and we can count votes in one day like they did in Argentina when they elected a libertarian, Javier Millet, for the mm -hmm. first time ever. And that, you know, they de departed socialism into true conservatism. And right. he has slashed the welfare budget down there and brought his country from the uh, red to the black literally overnight. Yeah, he's he's uh, basically replicating you know President Trump over there, you know, and then cutting seventy thousand government workers and just slashing the, you know, chewing the fat or slashing the fat rather, and uh, yeah, doing it systematically. To your point, uh, thank you for the update on uh, on Mike Lindell. That's good to know. I appreciate that, and I'm sure our, view our viewers will as well. Uh, nice segue, uh, and to what you were talking about with respect to the Biden. Um, so we know that the D's and the deep state know they're going to have to switch him, whoever that is, out at some point. Um, I was wondering if you could opine maybe on, based on your educational background, your knowledge and facts geopolitically, and just you know your self-awareness of what's going on in, in the situation here. In terms of the DNC uh, convention coming in Chicago, I think that's sometime in June, if I'm not mistaken. Do you think that might be the time where they switch him out? Would be. Um, I mean, I, you know, he's having trouble, I think, yet still, I don't think his Ohio uh, ballot um, problem has been solved. Last I checked, I'd have to double check that, but he was, his name was not technically on the ballot in Ohio. Mm. So there is that problem right there. Of course, Kamala Harris has always been the easy de facto favorite because she's a woman and she's a minority. And, you know, as well, I mean, while many of us can't stand the cackling hyena, uh, she would be an easy, easy sell, right? Biden could suffer some sort of medical, you know, malfunction, which I submit to you, he's nothing but one giant medical malfunction. Mm -hmm. Gavin Newsom would be another obvious choice. You could put a Newsom-Harris ticket together. Uh, either one could be the top tier, top tier ticket. Uh, those to me seem to be the most um, serious de facto fake phony fraud um, selected officials that would be placed into that arena for yet another election theft. How America is going to handle that, I don't know. Um, I don't know if America has the stomach to go through this again, um, but I also know that uh, the Democrats are above the law. They have hubris that eventually they will choke on, and mm -hmm. they see nothing wrong with the way they behave. They know they're operating above the law. They know they're operating outside the law. They know they are operating completely Ill illegally. And yet they don't care. They know that we know that these people are sitting in office without proper oaths of office. We've exposed that two years ago. Uh, Ju Rudy Giuliani did a podcast with Todd Callender a week ago Friday, and that was the subject of discussion. And Rudy Giuliani's eyeballs about popped out of his head, his jaw hit the table and said to Todd, please send me everything you have. Because, of course, Rudy Giuliani is also being attacked by the very same people that are attacking President Trump. And none of those people have valid oaths of office on file. So how can you legitimately hold a position as special prosecutor uh, and go after uh, a formerly seated president that has presidential immunity and claim he doesn't have immunity and take a case to the Supreme Court? Uh, it's just, or it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. How do these people even have the audacity? But they do because they really believe that they are, in, and they, they can operate without impunity or with impunity, excuse me. So um, again, if if the, if the Democrats want to just keep status quo, I think they're going to really have to do a gut check whether Joe Biden's true physical health can sustain another four years or at least get him through the election. And maybe that's their don't rock the boat because, you know, they think they've sold the bill of goods that Joe Biden had 81 million votes. Maybe they really think they have enough media power to continue to uh, convince Americans that Joe Biden was lawfully elected. I think the majority of Americans would say, no, they know he wasn't. And I believe the polls have already reflected that, that they know yeah. Joe Biden didn't win the election. So, you know, I think they're going to be put in the um, unenviable position 
to determine whether or not they need to swap him out and what excuse they will use. So I don't put it past him to do what you suggested, that it would be a swap out at convention for health reasons or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, we shall see. But whatever it is, the election is going to be very, very uh, difficult this November, uh, up to and including maybe not even having one if we have some sort of pandemic event. You don't know. They're gearing up for, for, for a lot of different contingencies. That I'm very convinced of. Yeah, I agree. They're going to, like you said, they're a caged animal. They're wounded. Their, their backs are against the wall. They're going to scratch and claw to the end. But, <clears throat> but we also, there's more of us than them. Uh, we know what they're going to do. There's moves and counter moves, as you're aware. And I think that enough Americans galvanizing with, of course, patriots like us and then the military can counteract what agendas they have. And of course, trust in God in the process. Go ahead. Yeah, the, you know, I want to just <laughs> comment on the fact that you said there's more of us than them. That is true. But what there isn't more of is there isn't more of us that are actively engaged in mm. solving the problem. Right. And this has been my calling now for the past year. I have, as you know, been doing uh, this new media stuff since 2015, right? This is nine years for me now. Not that that's such a big deal. It's not because there's people like Hannity that have been around for 30 years and whatever. Um, but again, nine years of talking about the problems and problems and they're doing this and they're doing that and the invasion and on and but I, I finally said, I've had it. I said, if we're not bringing solutions to the table for real Americans that give a damn to sink their teeth into and execute, then we're wasting our time because America knows something's dramatically wrong, but they don't know what to do about it. So I've actively sought out relationships with organizations that are plugging people in to solutions, tactical civics being one of them with the grand jury, our country, our choice is uh, mobilized on the ground in counties and they are, you know, facilitating true patriot action on the ground to start to root out the rot in the municipal and in the county level. Um, you know, there's other organizations out there as well. But if we don't start to identify and start going to our school board meetings, start going to the county commission meetings and listening from the back of the room, arms crossed, steely eyed stare on those public officials and let them know that we know what they're doing is wrong. There's tools out there at we the people number two dot us we the people two dot us that gives you templated affidavits and notices that you can send your local public county commissioner, mayor, councilman, dog catcher, whatever, and say we see you. And you can get ten of your friends together to all send the same notice with the same thing to, to one official. When they feel the heat. Mm -hmm. believe it. They want to change what they're doing because they don't want to go down with the ship. And you're starting to see yeah. people resign. I think, who was it? Um, supervisor elections in uh, somewhere. I, I just read it this morning. I can't remember. She's like, I didn't know I was doing it wrong. She's now giving the, I didn't know I made a mistake excuse, which, okay, now that you, you've identified there's a mistake and she identified, yep, there was a mistake. I didn't know I was making one. Fix it. Mm -hmm. If you're not fixing it, then that official will be personally liable when the people come back and sue. That's as simple as that. And they will sue and they are suing and they're changing laws and legislation around the country, but they're getting zero attention from the mainstream media because it's the people that are doing the business of the government, which is what our business is. We are the government. Yeah. Well, it's about being self-governing, like you said, Correct. In, in, in essence, basically. And yeah, I, I agree that there's not enough of us, but I think, again, with groundswell uh, podcasts such as this, hopefully, we're getting that message out to a galvanized community of people who want to take action and just don't know the best way to go about it. Or they, they want to find their purpose, but they're not sure how to you know, center it. And, and you know, hopefully things like this will, will help them to uh, give them a grounding place to move forward in the process and add to the cachet of the people standing up against the, the old guard that is eviscerating, like you said, but in front of our eyes. And then I'm sure you read it as well, Anne, just it's not exactly directly related, but it's indirectly related with respect to Target. Got a lot of pressure about, you know, the transgender and their woke agenda. And they're now debasing that they're taking that off and they're, uh, they're you know, basically capitulating and, and moving that agenda away from their business and because they got enough public pressure. So to your point, when Americans do stand up and say enough and actually take the action, which we're always a proponent of on this channel, uh, especially with respect to the finances, uh, galvanized change does happen. Sweeping change right. does, does happen. And, and, and you're part of that. So we're, so we're honored to have you here. Um, so transitioning a little bit off of the Democrat side to more of obviously the good guy side, 
Uh, President Trump, there's been a lot of speculation about who his VP pick is going to be. I was curious if you kind of had any thoughts about, you know, who you uh, who you thought it might be. I would love to personally have him see Kristen Noemi run. You know, we both know why South Dakota, very strong uh, constitutionalist, Kristen Noemi. Um, I think she would be a great choice for him. Uh, she would galvanize a lot of votes and she would be very pro-constitutional um, in, in her, uh, her stances just in, within the state. But again, that, that's just my thoughts. I was wondering who you thought he might pick in this process. Uh, I'm actually leaning towards like Devin Nunes or even General Flynn uh, because I see the hijacking of world sovereignty directly attributed to the intelligence community doing the work of the globalist elite. You've got intelligence communities working together, collaborating around the world for the benefit of their masters. And, uh, you know, it, let's just go back to President Trump and the Russia hoax. That was the intelligence community operation. That was our own CIA working with MI5 and MI6, right? They said, we got to get, we got to dirty up Trump. We need information. And so, you know, against the Steele dossier was a total fabrication. And it, it just goes on from there. Um, I'm very much a proponent for deep sixing the FBI and the CIA and maybe cherry picking a few people out of there that pass a very high sniff test and rolling them into a, an intelligence organization run by the military. Maybe that becomes Space Force's role. I don't know. Um, that's not my area of expertise. A General Flynn would be perfect for something like that, or Devin Nunes would be perfect for something like that. But you need a really strong Secretary of Defense, and you need somebody who knows intelligence. Devin, and they both do. Intel, uh, Nunez was, you know, uh, chairman of the intelligence community uh, when he was in Congress, and of course, General Flynn was the head of the Defense Intelligence um, Department, the DIA. So I absolutely, or agency, excuse me, I absolutely think those two would make exemplary, um, no nonsense, common sense vice presidents. They have a great understanding of geopolitics. Um, but they also can whip the intelligence community into shape and they can root out the rot that is in there that has just been basically sold off to the highest bidder. And that's essentially what we have problematically in this country right now. I mean, look at the intelligence community that has lured people into the Capitol. That was an F Fed surrection without a doubt. That has been proven already. They don't like us calling it that, but that's in fact what it is. So um, those would be my picks. Personally, but you know, I, I'm open to other suggestions. I just don't want to see rhinos, uh, f really, because I'm, you know, we're way past that at this point. Oh We've yeah, got to get fresh blood in there, and we got to shake the rug big time and get rid of the fleas. Hundred percent. This this reset is systemic across the board: geopolitical, financial, spiritual, health, emotional, mindset, attitudinal. It's yeah, it's cross platform, like you said. Um, well, uh, you know, I'm sure whoever he'll pick will be great. Again, I just was always wanted to ask you about that. I'm glad you brought up, by the way, very, very good uh, telepathic uh, 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 chemistry between us and the, the aspect of what you were saying was kind of what I was thinking in terms of uh, Mike Lindell. We had uh, Derek Johnson on our show last week, and I asked him the same question about with respect. I'm going to ask you about Mike Lindell. Is he you know, on the good side, the bad side? because there can be a lot of uh, misinformation going both ways, I think has people confused about that. And uh, the details he gave were, were very copious, but some of our viewers felt it was a little bit hazy. So I wanted to kind of get your take on that and see what you- Unequivocally, think. good side. Okay. Not even a question mark, zero. Absolutely, Mike Lindell is a patriot, he's a hero. He has spent millions of dollars of his own money, which is why he had to open the Lindell Offense Fund because between the Dominion lawsuits and the millions of dollars he spent defending himself in those ridiculous lawsuits uh, because he's exposing the truth, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is how, this is called lawfare. And uh, you know, Mike Lindell hasn't got some secret slush fund that the intelligence community is giving him so he can continue to be a distraction over there. No, he legitimately believes in what he's doing. And I believe in what he's doing. I believe we've had a multi-vectored attack on our election systems. It wasn't just machine <clears throat> votes. It wasn't just ballot harving, harvesting. It wasn't just mail-in fraud. It wasn't just a uh, phantom voters. It wasn't just uh, door three, a drawer three in the in the machines. It was a whole host of things, including the fact that state statutes were not followed to the letter of the law, which resulted in voter disenfranchise, which is a civil rights violation. And if all the other election integrity lawsuits were not able to acquire standing in the Supreme Court, even by the parties with whom they were affected because they were the parties running for office, well, then the, we the people 
The Supreme Court is a Article Three common law court. It is our highest court of the land. It is there to defend and protect the Constitution. So if our constitutional rights have been violated and it's a civil rights issue, they have got to hear this case in an emergency fashion. And I believe that also will, we're going to know really quickly whether we have a court or not. But Mike Lindell, make no doubt about it. He's a 100% hero. I, 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 if anybody thinks otherwise, I vehemently disagree with them. Sure. Mike, Mike Flynn, you mean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and it wasn't to be controversial. I just wanted to bring some clarity. No, 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 no. I just, I'm putting my red line in the sure. sand on Mike Lindell. I stand with Mike Lindell no matter what. I, you know what, here, I'm going to be as bold as to say this. Let's say Mike Lindell was given really bad information by some nefarious CIA operative. And maybe that CIA operative is married to a Dominion lawyer for all I know. Mm -hmm. Let's just say the information that they got from that individual was really just bogus and that none of this PCAP data, none of this stuff with Dominion even ever existed. And everything he's been given is a fraud. Well, you know what? The fact of the matter is he's still pushing for paper ballots, yeah. which is what we all should be pushing for. They ran an entire election and elected a libertarian in Argentina on paper ballots and counted all the votes in one day. So if they can do that, we can do that. And that was an upset election in Argentina. So there's no reason why we can't do that. So let's just assume Mike Lindell is completely out in left field and everything he says is wrong about the Dominion machines. At the end of the day, he is pushing for paper ballots. What is wrong with that? That is exactly what needs to happen. And that will solve all this problem from beginning to end. Absolutely. So let's follow up just real quick on that, on the back side of the end. Let's say that uh, General Flynn is asked to run uh, VP. Do you think he will take it? Absolutely. He's a, he's a, he's a military man, 33 years. If he's asked to serve, he will serve again. Okay. He serves at the pleasure of the president. You darn well better take that to the bank. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thanks for clarifying that. We appreciate that. Um, and just wrapping up some of the geopolitical side before we shift real quick to the financial aspect. Um, what do you see from your purview on things in terms of uh, China, Taiwan? It seems like it's, you know, it's brimming under the surface. There's, there's more talks of it. We kind of know Russia already has pretty much decimated Ukraine, and we're just waiting for that final surrender point uh, that we all know is coming. Um, but where do you see China-Taiwan in terms of, you know, maybe a time frame or, or positioning of where they stand and, and making their move there? Well, um, hmm. I guess the bigger question is, does China need to invade uh, Taiwan in order to get unification? I don't know. But Taiwan was never part of China to begin with. It just mm -hmm. wasn't. So you know, I have Michael Yan is actually over in Taiwan right now, and he's talking to people all over Taiwan. He's traveling all over Taiwan, and and his information that he relays back to me is that they're ready for an invasion at any particular moment, I mean, at any minute. They're expecting to be invaded. This is the this is the sentiment of people over in Taiwan. They've lived like that for quite a long time. Um, will it happen? Probably could be, but is it? A, is it an area that the United States need to be uber concerned about right now? I just came back from Ohio when I was speaking to uh, the uh, lady that uh, actually helped put on the event at her, Teresa Gregory, she owns a beautiful um, horse farm and she has a, a huge facility there where she does a lot of events. And she told me that Intel, Intel computers, Intel chip manufacturer mm -hmm. is building an Intel manufacturing plant in the area near her horse farm. And because of that, she's going to build a boutique hotel because she expects to garner a lot of business from people coming in to meet in, uh, in at Intel. And she said further to Intel bring, building there, we are also going to be seeing, it's going to be called the next Silicon Valley. There'll be a lot more uh you know, IT uh, type work and manufacturing plants, et cetera. You know, basically the Silicon Valley of San Francisco, which mm -hmm. has now been completely covered in feces, thanks to Nancy Pelosi and Gavin Newsom, right. is leaving because of crime, prices, real estate, taxes. They're looking for other solutions. Ohio offers a much better alternative. And so a lot of companies will be will be relocating there. How will that impact Taiwan? Well, one of the things the United States needs to do is they need to get back into the manufacturing of chips because we've, again, offshored all of this, right? We've yeah. offshored everything. And under Biden, we've just, you know, basically slit our wrists and cut our noses off despite our faces. So the fact that you're seeing some of this migration, whether it's good, bad, or ugly in terms of the people they're going to drag with them out of California into Ohio, that's a double-edged sword, right? Why you want the manufacturing and you give them the tax abatements also comes the people and it comes with their political ideology. So we have a lot of work to do as Americans to uh, I don't want to say rehabilitate because that sounds, you know, not very pleasant, but we need to educate them 
on sound money and sound fiscal and sound financial uh, policies. And then we need to you know, help them extricate their emotional and their cultural policies out of politics, i.e. if they want to be trans, if they want to be whatever, that has nothing to do with the job you're doing and the politics of your community. It has to strictly be on an economic decision and what's healthy for the community in terms of finances and safety, food, security, self-sustainability, so that you can weather whatever you need to should we have some sort of mass interruption of whatever. So going back to your question about Taiwan and China, it seems very plausible that it's going to happen. But as far as America's interests, we need to keep our nose to the grindstone here. We need to talk about bringing back manufacturing of chips and technology semiconductors here in the United States. We need to collaborating with our sisters uh, down in Austin, Texas, for those for those resources. And we should not be involved and engaged in whether or not China invades Taiwan. Because at this point, we don't have the resources to fight a war over there. And God forbid something breaks out in the Middle East. We just don't have the resources at all. And it will leave our country wide open to the invasion that is already underway because we won't have resources to defend ourselves, which we are going to see that, I believe, that war here in this country in the not too distant future. Yeah. And you know, I, I don't think we necessarily, we don't need to be involved as a country at all. I think it's mutually exclusive to your point. But um, as you remember, or you may or may not recall in our last uh, discussion last month, and we had China is really the two sides, right? There's the CCP and then the Republic side right. that she right. is on through BRICS. And then maybe this is a good segue on the financial uh, side to shift over there. Um, in our camp, our team, we believe that China, the real invasion for that is a, is a distraction for the Republic side to free up Vietnam. Because remember, they have a lot of silver and Litecoin that's going to free up the Vietnamese dong to happen and get Vietnam enough away from communism to, to untentacle them. And then you have the other side of it we talked about, where I asked you about um, you know, Israel's involvement, right? Because now we've seen them attack Rafa. I believe they just, either they're starting to, or they just dealt with Hezbollah. And next it's going to be Iraq and Iran to free up, uh, because Israel can split the difference between the US militias and the Iranian proxies that are taking up, uh, just like here in America, the countries copy each other. You see uh, an illegal government or proxy government in Iraq. Uh, Israel would do their part basically to extricate uh, Iraq and free them up financially, which is what we believe on our side is happening right now, which is actually quite exciting. So again, it just proves that things are not always as they appear to be, as you well know. But it's going to be interesting to watch how these events all dovetail or play out or even intersect to a certain degree. Um, on the financial side, and you see recently that uh, Alex Mooney of West Virginia just introduced a gold standard bill uh, to reinstate the gold standard. We know that President Trump is all about that. I kind of believe he's going to bring Judy Shelton in on the Treasury side. He's been an advocate for a while. He tried that in his first term. I'm pretty sure once he has the full support of the real government constitutionally, he'll be able to do that. Then you have Zimbabwe joining BRICS along with, we talked about aforementioned Vietnam, Iraq and Nigeria and about 40 other plus countries. You have the Zimbabwe uh, ZIG that is now sort of tucked in their RTGS dollars into gold through QR codes, which is pretty exciting because it, it's going to be backed by a ton of gold and their bonds as well. Uh, Nebraska just ended the capital gains taxes for gold and silver. So another state jumped on board you were talking yep. about. And I say all this to say, Ann, is, is it, my question is rounding up to you. But what we believe here on our team is that the real key marker, and I want to really interested to get your viewpoint on this, is with all of what I just said, we already know about BRICS, we already know about the gold standard, but what we're watching is the Fed 10-year Treasury bond yield is cratering over the edge, and the Euro European Central Bank, former uh, uh, IMF Director Christine Lagarde, who just went from the frying pan to the fire in that role, right, basically, uh, saved the bond market temporarily about two weeks ago, but I don't think they're going to be able to do that much longer. And it seems to be that that is a tipping point for the U.S. dollar because you have Japan who's dumping them over the side of the river like the Boston Tea Party, right? And so they're looking to join, I think, at some point, BRICS. Do you agree or do you have a different point of view with respect to the 10-year Treasury yield being sort of the, the death nail for the U.S. dollar and what other countries do to get away from it? <laughs> Absolutely. What do we have? The Treasury, I'm looking right now, 10-year, uh, it added more than five basis points to trade at 4.5%. I mean, <laughs> we've got like this inversion going on, you know? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's curve. That is the kiss of death for the U.S. dollar. I'm so sorry. I mean, people don't understand Absolutely. that because we're going to go into hyperinflation. We can't afford that. Our debt's at what? How many, what's our debt at now? 34 trillion? 
30, I think it's closer to 35 trillion every 35. 90, okay. 90 I know it's, days. Yeah. I, I, if you don't pay attention to it and it goes up like that, but it, it's, we're going into hyperinflation and I think we're going to see another round of hyperinflation and it is going to be unlike anything we've ever seen in this country. Yep. Um, personally, um, I, I don't see how we can sustain that. There's just simply no way, which is, I believe one of the reasons why these, their NATO and the intelligence community and the bankers are all collaborating on how we, how can we get the U S into war? Because that's mm -hmm. a big war machine, right? They need that. What Washington DC military industrial complex to manufacture as much war machine power as possible. And the bankers need to print the money to finance it. And they want the U S taxpayer to pay the interest on it. Problem is we won't be able to afford the interest. We just don't have the receivables for that. So th this is going to implode, but they're, you know, of course they're laundering as much as possible and they're keeping billions for themselves. It's, it's about, it's a sick cycle. And I guess mm -hmm. they don't understand that once they destroy us, we're destroyed. But again, remember depopulation agenda is also part of their plan. So this can create world depopulation at the same time. They're, they're basically killing all the birds with one stone. So I, you know, a caution people to, if you don't own Zim or dinar or other currencies that are going through the revaluation process. If you don't own physical, physical gold and silver, not in a depository, you don't physically have possession of it somewhere mm -hmm. in your fingertip reach, wherever you want to store it, but in your control, uh, you're in trouble. If you don't have some fake fiat currency for the immediate transition, when the banks start closing, let's say your bank closes and how do you get your money out? Make sure you have enough money for at least a month or two or three, whatever you can afford to take out, have. And then have physical gold and silver available. Have your food stock with pantry, your, your pantry stock with food and water. Um, if, if you can stock, you know, energy for your for your automobiles, because we're going to see, I think, some pretty troubling times ahead. Not not anything that we have ever seen in this country before. And uh, you know, to the point of treasury yields, that to me is the canary in the coal mine before this whole thing goes kaboom. And the reason they're offering, like you, you've already laid out the reasons why treasury yields are going up because people are liquidating and getting the hell out of them because they suck because <laughs> they know the United States is bankrupt. Yeah. So like, we don't need your crappy debt. We are moving over here where we have asset backed currency. Why would we want to invest in treasury? You guys provide nothing to back it up. Hell, JP Morgan, did you know this? Moved a majority of their gold, their physical gold to depositories in yeah. Singapore. Singapore. What does that tell you? <laughs> Yeah. It's not here, baby. And and to your point, absolutely. And to your point, and following up with that, who is one of the major banks that's participating in the currency reset? J.P. Morgan. Right. So they um, they know. Th they've always known, which is why Jamie Dimon has been out there broadcasting for over a year now. Trouble on the horizon, storm crowds are brewing. It's like yep. he knows what's coming because guess who's architecting it? He is. And now Jamie. he's absolved of any sin because he warned you. Right. They always create an antidote for themselves on the back door. They just never thought that we, the people, would be able to participate. But that's where God makes a way in channels like this to, to counteract that. So I think a good follow-up question, Ann, is when those treasury yields do implode, even if it's just, you know, 10% makes a huge difference, as you know. And I think that's probably the rate we're looking at here for the hyperinflation and de-dollarization and the east-west reset you were referring to. Um, how much more does that exacerbate the already toll it's taken on commercial real estate, residential, banks, uh, school systems, um, you know, Main Street. It defunds it all. It 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 bankrupts the whole caboodle. Um, listen, I recall in 2018 when Paul Ryan tried to slip in a poison pill into tax reform. He wanted to. Paul Ryan and Chairman Brady, that were working with President Trump on tax reform in 2018, wanted to take the uh, depreciation schedule for commercial real estate like in the 80s when they reduced it from 39 years to 15 years and it created mm -hmm. a tax shelter that everybody ran out and bought commercial real estate and we had too much supply and not enough renters. So therefore not enough rent, meaning not enough money to pay the mortgages on these commercial properties. People defaulted, banks went bankrupt. That was the SNL crisis of the 80s. Well, Paul Ryan thought he was gonna do all of his billionaire friends with all this real estate a whole big solid when he did 100% uh, immediate depreciation of all commercial real estate. So that means zero depreciation. So you go straight, I mean, a full 100% depreciation, excuse me, 100% depreciation on the property. Buy a million dollar property, leverage 800,000, write the whole million off on your taxes. Not over 39 years, not over 50, write it all off. So you can imagine these billionaires sitting there holding all this real estate in 2018 uh, would have been able to dump all their stuff on the unsuspecting buyer who would have then been holding the bag when what happened? COVID, several years later. 
And all those buildings today are now sitting empty and the commercial real estate industry is in major crisis. So inadvertently, yours truly was on the major front of the campaign to shut that down. And we did. We shut it down. We got rid of that poison pill. So now you have these commercial uh, and that's what the PPP was all about, was trying to figure out how to make those people whole because they're sitting there with empty real estate. People are now working from home, silver lining. Right. But um, it is going to be, you know, this is going to be another way that we can defund the public education and get people into homeschooling and into shared schooling. And perhaps we can even go back to the great model where somebody stays home and raises the kids so that you're not sending your child to an indoctrination center and God your forbid. morals and values can be instilled. So I always try to find the silver lining in all of this. And I'm, I'm actually cheering the bank collapse on. I'm like, let's, let's just get it over with. It's coming. Why are we waiting? The yeah. sooner, the better we can get through this washing, this washing machine blender, the faster it, we can get out the other side because you always come out the other side. It's just, let's be as prepared as possible. Thousand percent. I'm, I'm with you. I've been rooting against the deep state dollar for 11 years since I've been in this movement because I've come to realize like you, we've enslaved the entire world. I mean, we know yeah. the enemy and it is us. Right. That's and, right. And these countries don't we want them to be free. It's better for them. It's better for us. Everybody needs to get back to sovereignty and nationalism. Uh, it's been proven time and again. So I'll, I'll leave you with these last two questions. I'll wrap them in one end for for posterity of time. Um, obviously, you're not a financial advisor, not neither am I, but you have your finger on the pulse pretty well of what's going on, obviously, which is one of the many reasons you're here. The first question is, would you surmise that this reset would happen before President Trump steps back into office optically? And two, we see XRP. We know that's a big component of the blockchain, a big component of the new digital economic reality with you know natural assets, like you said, gold, silver, copper, and the like. Uh, we're waiting for their case to come to fruition when Judge Torres announces her decision, clearly that they've won, that they're a currency and not a security, because we know the SEC was in bed with Ethereum to keep that monopoly. So XRP plays a pivotal role like XLM and XDC and many other good uh, blockchain-based cryptos or asset-backed. Um, so the, I guess the question is, would you see this happening before Trump returns and how much of an importance do you put on uh, you know, cryptos like XRP? Uh, that's a great question. I'm not really one for dishing out dates, but sure. if... I was a betting man or woman or woman. <laughs> I would suggest, I would, I, I would think that, you know, they're going to fo foist this onto the next presidency. They don't want to do this before the election, but it will be teed up and ready to collapse in that window between election day and inauguration day. That's when I see all this stuff coming undone. So it really doesn't matter. Um, who's in office in terms of that. My timing for this has always been in that window because it makes the most sense so that they, if they still think they can somehow steal the election to get Biden in and make it look like he has some, some significant platform, they can't totally destabilize everything. They've got to try and keep it together. My hope is that we put enough pressure on them and through bricks that they destabilize prior to and that just adds more fuel to the fire as to why they can't elect Biden. But then that leaves the task for Trump to which I have full faith and credit. He's up to the job. He's a businessman. Absolutely. He runs businesses. He knows how to run a PNL, yeah. uh, and he's a proponent for gold. So I think this will all sort itself out. That's and a he, simple answer. No, I agree. And he was the king of bankruptcy, like what he did with his companies in 92, and he, re, he rebuilt them quickly. I think he's going to replicate that in America as well. But uh, just to confirm, you would are you a fan of XRP and cryptos like that? Uh Yes, I'm a fan of crypto, period. Um, I actually own a small amount of XRP. I bought it a long time ago, just yeah. prior to the SEC problems. And when I studied what the SEC was doing, I realized, well, you know, since uh, they're trying to turn crypto into something they can tax, it makes sense that they're attacking XRP and Ripple. Um, I saw what they did with FTX, and they mm -hmm. tried to use that as another vector in which to create an asset class that could be taxed. And that was after, you know, FTX got outed. So they're like, well, since we're already in trouble with that, we might as well make them uh, a target. Um, and uh, again, it was another failed attempt. So uh, let's see what happens. I mean, this is, this is exciting times. You know, I just, I'm a big believer in gold and silver and I have a little bit of crypto, um, because again, I don't uh, know that I completely trust it. Now I know I have some people that love Bitcoin and they're it's unhackable. It's all this stuff, awesome, um, and I probably should own more of it. But it's super expensive right now, so I can only afford about eighty <laughs> little bits of it. So <laughs> right, right, right. 
No, and I, I think that you know now that we're through the Bitcoin happening, I, I think we're going to see some adjustments on Bitcoin where they're going to drop it to a certain point that'll be, make it more affordable and attractive, and then moon it, you know, October into May of next year in the Super Bowl cycle. So right. uh, that should skyrocket like XRP. Um, and it's great to have you. Uh, last thoughts that you have for the audience today, and where can people find out about your work? Well, last thoughts are, uh, America, I, I say this every single time when I close, please find your find your people, get engaged. You know, being a keyboard warrior is awesome, I know, because I'm one, but you've got to find your voice and you've got to find people in your local community that you can collaborate with from a food security, a national security, and of course your election security. These are all critical features. Um, be prepared in your communities for what is coming in terms of total destabilization of your security, physical security, mm -hmm. uh, food, guns, ammo, uh, and cash on hand are going to be very critical things to have and know who your neighbors are and a communications plan. You know, Hey folks, if the, you know, what hits the fan, make a plan. We're going to meet at the local library on Thursday nights or whatever it is, but start to circulate that. If you live in an HOA, start to go to your HOA meetings and start talking about how we can turn our yards into victory farms. Somebody mm -hmm. grow tomatoes, somebody grow zucchini, what have you. But we've got to have bartering. We've got to have food, security. And, um, you know, again, know who your local representatives are. Start asking them to advocate for you. You can come together on election security issues. You can come together on on uh, holding them accountable. We the people to number two dot US has got great resources there for your local citizens to start notifying your local council members and county commissioners about the things you know they're doing wrong, holding them responsible. And then we can start to have snap elections and remove and replace these people because this is what we need to do. So I'm an advocate. You can find me on Twitter at Ann Vandersteel. I'm on Rumble, Ann Vandersteel. I'm everywhere, Ann Vandersteel. So <laughs> check me out. Absolutely. We'll definitely promote that along. And folks, you've heard Ann talk a lot about uh, becoming basically your own central bank. And that's what we advocate here all the time. So if you are looking for precious metals, liquidating a 401k or IRA or different options to get at precious metals, gold, silver, copper, we'll leave those links in the description. And also she's mentioned it before. She's also said it again. If you are looking to get dinar, dongs or Zim or Boulevard or, or improve your position accordingly, we'll leave that link in the description as well. And Vanderstill, honored to have you. We we'll look forward to having you back in the near future. Thanks, John. Thanks, Sarah.